production six colleagues and fellow colleagues that have joined in. Uh, maybe let me start off uh, first by introducing myself. I'm from Kenya. I'm from the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. Um, I'm the chairperson of today's webinar. The topic of today um, is talk about the, the, the importance of services as a sector and its linkages to industrial policy and economic policy policy. Mm -hmm. Many of us who are in the policy space, we have often, uh, I don't know, by design or by, I guess, the corners where we are making a contribution to policy, we tend to forget the role of services or underplay the role of services in as a means to industrialization and how as a sector it has grown especially in the last 20 to 30 years to enable some of our productive sectors to be where they are today so for me i think today um uh, looking through the papers that are going to be put forward uh, by our speakers which i will introduce a shortly is to look at the role of services uh, in economic policy and industrial policy policy and to really ask ourselves the question whether we are properly accounting for the contribution of the services um, in, 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 in our sectors and also are we accounting for them properly in our official statistics. I think as I've already made the point that the role of services in industrialization, in employment and innovation and trade, global trade in, in general, can, cannot be ignored or underplayed. Um, given the, uh, I guess, services as an enabler to economic activities and services as a tradable activity um, on its own. In the last um, uh, 20, 30 years, I think we have seen a uh, tenfold of uh, growth in services and depending on what we count as services, and I mean some of us who work in the productive sectors, we account for it as if it's a means of production, but if you look at it as its own contribution, you realize that actually, um, uh, you know, if you account for marketing, designs, logistics, uh, the way that we develop the um, skills, uh, you know, um, incrementally in South Africa, we've also promoted the industry for the business processing or sourcing, which has really grown in leaps and bounds, especially in terms of youth unemployment, youth employment, and contribution to GDP. So when I was um, requested to come and moderate this session, I was like, well, for the first time I'm getting out of my comfort zones where I normally talk mainly about the productive sectors, meaning agriculture, manufacturing, and mining, and look at how every sector of the economy comes together because of the contribution of services. Uh, in today's session, uh, we will um, uh, get Two main inputs. Uh, one from um, the first one will come from Dr. Neva Maketa, who is a senior economist at TIPS, a very seasoned economist uh, that has contributed enormously to economic policy and industrial policy in South Africa. He has worked for a number of government departments, uh, including even here the DTIC and economic uh, development. He has written a lot on, 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 on South Africa economic. Uh, uh, economic policy and genetic, uh, the, 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 the economy itself and has worked for many years in uh, various uh, government departments. So Niva, we look forward to, uh, to having your input. Um, the second paper will come from, or the second input will come from, is a joint input from Dr. Pizarin and Professor Turok. Professor Turok, when I saw your name, <laughs> the first thing I asked my colleagues uh, the teacher that is, Professor Turok, by any chance of related to Ben Turok, who has really been uh, a, a biggest contributor and a shape, a shape to our industrial policy. And in the chat today, it's good to see a number of familiar names uh, that have really contributed a lot in the evolution of South African uh, industrial policy. And, uh, Dr. Pizai is a senior research specialist um, from. Uh, the Human Resource, uh, uh, the Human Sciences, uh, Sciences Research Council, uh, and also uh, at the University of Queensland, uh, he's got enormous expertise in macroeconomic uh, data analysis, um, and has worked across uh, a number of um, uh, household uh, data sets. So he, he has done a recent uh, research projects 
across uh, issues relating to regional economic development, city, um, uh, city region economies, um, uh, tradable services, uh, special, uh, special inequality, um, social mobility, urbanization, housing, and uh, migration. And I think given his world of expertise and where we are in terms of work, but they need to drive some regional integration and bring about the implementation of the continental free trade area. Some of the areas that we're working are uh, with the assistance state with uh, the policy going forward. Uh, Professor Churo, um, also a distinct um, research fellow at uh, HSRC and um, at the University of the Free State. He's got uh, enormous expertise in the uh, in, international experience in research in city and regional economic development, tradable services, organization, housing, and labor markets. I look forward to having the discussion um, today. Uh, Neva, I think uh, we will start with your input. Um, and maybe it's for yours. We'll take the input from Dr. Pizarre and Dr. Pachula. Um Thanks. Um, uh, okay, so the, the slightly cryptic heading on the program um, is because we have a longer paper on services and industrial policy, which is available at, at our website, um, which covers a lot of other things. Um, I wrote it a year ago, so of course I don't remember half of what's in there, but anyways. Um, so, oh, sorry. Now, of course, my screen's not moving, just a sec. Okay. So I think the critical issue here that we're talking about is where do services fit into industrial policy and I think just to be clear what we mean by services, they're defined as producing intangible goods. Um, so they're producing things that are valued as society and the That's economy, but are not tangible, such as skills and healthcare and design. Uh, one of the things that comes up is there's always some link to goods production, but that link can be varied and evolving. So for instance, music, you know, back in the day we had records. Well, back, we've always had published music in the form of paper publications of music, and then we had records, and then we had CDs, and someplace in there were cassettes too. But now what we have is streaming, is that a good? There are tangible changes in the real world as a result, you know, within our computers, but we experience it as something totally intangible. So, you know, is the, is music as a service when you hear it in a concert, but it's also a good when you, when you um, buy a record? if you're still buying records because you're a connoisseur. Another thing about services that makes them difficult is that they're very often public goods in the sense they're provided by the state because they, um, they're provided by the state because they are, the externalities can't be captured easily by the private sector. So things like education and healthcare and social welfare and so on are critical for building a stable society, which is of course in itself a prerequisite for an effective industrialization policy. Um, but they are often something that the private sector will underprovide because they can't get them to market effectively. And most of the discussion here, I'm not gonna talk about retail um, because there's been a lot of work done on that separately. So what the graph, what the picture is just showing, it's clearly a Venn diagram. It's just showing that if you look at services in terms of what the different industries are reaching, some are really geared towards households, things like various personal services like daycare, um, a lot of public transport except for commuter transport, culture and recreation. Some are geared towards um, companies, but we can divide those into two. One is for production like engineering and design, whereas there's some that are really just designed to reinforce marketing and ownership, such as advertising, distribution and accounting. And then there are big areas of overlap, like legal and finance, both households and businesses use, but also critically things like education, healthcare, commuter transport, logistics, cleaning, security, repairs are very important for business, but also for households and so on. So the point is you can't really talk about services as homogenous and you can't really divide them that cleanly from goods production, production of tangible goods. In industrial policy, you know, and this is really feeding into a debate, you know, we often see a very strong argument that industrial policy has to focus primarily on manufacturing and services are seen as the opposite of that. That in effect, what we're saying is if services are secondary or even 
deleterious to manufacturing somehow when we're driving industrialization, then obviously government shouldn't be putting its resources or its regulatory power into driving, into promoting services, but rather should focus narrowly on manufacturing. And yet we know that service outputs are critical for inclusive industrialization. Um, if we're talking about the inclusivity side, because they're very labor intensive compared to manufacturing on the whole, but not, although not always, but usually, the outputs of services, I mean, they're a crucial source of jobs and opportunities for small businesses. So on the one hand, they generate a lot of jobs. And as I'll show, they've generated most jobs worldwide in the last 15, 20 years, sorry, 20, 30 years. But on the other hand, because they're labor intensive, it's easier for small businesses to get into services than something where you need lots of capital up front as mining or high tech manufacturing. They also provide important inputs for other industries, mostly through the business professions, logistics and marketing, cleaning and security. But even more important, perhaps, they are the critical way we invest in human capital through education and healthcare, and in social capital through things like social protection, hospitality, and cultural work. And you can't imagine industrialization functioning without these inputs. And yet we tend to take them for granted and not say, how do we maximize the benefits for industrialization? And I would argue that the reason the role of services is contested in industrial policy has several roots. Um, firstly, that the theory and po policy around industrial policy have actually not kept up, with the, kept up with the way modern production systems are evolving and the way services articulate with manufacturing in that context. Secondly, partially, as, again, as a result of history, our statistical and modeling methods inherently underestimate the, the impact of services on the economy and society. And then finally, there is a perception that services generate only low-level security, caring, and cleaning jobs, as opposed to decent work in manufacturing. So the argument is services jobs tend to be worse paid and more insecure. Um, and I think really why I'm talking about the evolution of services and the way they articulate with manufacturing is because in effect, over the past 200 years, since industrialization began, you can see a steady change in the role of services and in particular, the extent to which they are produced internally by households and by companies. And obviously this is something people have written about, not just me. Um, but really what you have is what's become different, I would argue in the last 10 years is that service industries have become critical to governance of global value chains. That is the way in which companies control global value chains and specifically the way companies in the global north control value chains and production in countries like South Africa. And that's true, obviously, particularly for R&D, engineering and design, as well as we've talked, I said, I'm not going to spend much time on retail, but the whole branding story has been important. And what it's been used is to control production of capital goods and advanced intermediate inputs, as well as branding. And what the graph shows, and we're going to circulate these, so I'm not going to walk through it, but what you can see is the pink stuff is where stuff is produced internally and really up through the Fordist models of the 1930s, a lot of services like, and production, but a lot of services like R&D, engineering, design, marketing, and legal, and so on, were generated but internally you... by the large companies. But a lot of those things have been externalized, but what's interesting is that in the global north, the companies have kept control of R&D, engineering, and design, um, and they've shifted production, especially of consumer goods, to the global south, but not capital goods. And obviously, the most clear example of that in South Africa is what's going on in the auto industry, where design, high-tech stuff, software, all of that, we import from the global north. Um, and we're producing mostly structural products and then assembling the, the final product. So the theoretical critiques that argue that services um, should not be really a focus of industrial policy have evolved over time. But I would argue that really a lot of it goes back to the classical economists, which is to say, particularly um, Smith and Marx. Um, and they were writing at a time, I mean, argue, yeah, they were writing at a time um, when there was industrials, industrialists were still emerging and their big conflict was with the landowning aristocracy for resources and for deregulation of national and international markets. And in that context, they explicitly defined services as the personal and state services that served the aristocracy as opposed to the kinds of things we think about services today. So they were really talking about, you know, 
the personal staff of the aristocracy, the armies and the tax collection by the aristocratic state. And from that standpoint, they argued services are both trivial and parasitic. So they're just using a value added that's produced by the rest of society. And the thing that I want to flag is I think that argument still shapes a lot of um, the discourse around services and industrial policy, even though it's clearly completely overtaken by events. It just doesn't really apply to the modern economy. Then in the 30s, you had the Stalinist and New Deal industrial policies, which I think in South Africa still really shape how we think about um, industrial policy, unfortunately. And those that era was characterized by big industrial and infrastructure projects with big state investment and leadership, which was possible because they were using relatively simple and centralized technologies. And honestly, the jobs, you know, when you think about the jobs, they were for men in hard hats, that is not professionals, largely manually, even if skilled, and definitely not women. Um, and the assumption, and you know, this this was the era that saw in South Africa the emergence of ESCOM and ISCOR and Transnet. Sassel came came in the fifties. So you've got these, even in South Africa, these very large infrastructure and production projects that were led by the state in the same way. Um, and the the thing about this approach was there was in fact very big investment, public state investment in particular in human and social capital going on. But it wasn't conceptualized as integral to industrial policy in the same way as building big dams and railroads. Then you had dependency theory and Asian industrialization in the 50s and 60s, where the focus was on saying, how do we diversify away from commodity production? So the argument was developing countries remain unindustrialized, remain poor because they are dependent on agriculture and mining. If they get into manufacturing, they can raise productivity and that will in itself raise living standards. In that context, it's worth noting, they didn't actually say yeah. that, but rather what they did was they kind of just ignored the services. So so they saw manu when they said manufacturing, they were really saying, what is the alternative to commodity production? They weren't really talking about the relationship between services and manufacturing. And then all of this kind of got reified from the 1960s in a more fixed way. So in the academic growth model debates, the argument was we need to look at different sectors and how they contribute to economic development, rather than having single sector models to just focus on the extent of investment. So firstly, Calder and then made the argument that manufacturing has larger multipliers and is associated historically with faster growth. And just to be clear, there's a problem with that, which is firstly, how do we think about other countries' historic experiences 20, 30, even 100 years ago? in developing our own industrial policy, but also how do we think about, you know, is the measurement of multipliers the best way or the only way to define the economic impacts of economic activity? And the second argument, which is actually a lot, a lot weaker and very anecdotal, is the argument that personal services are doomed to having low productivity because they rely on the personal relationship between individuals. And this comes from Baumol, but it still floats around a bit. So they can generate employment, but they can't foster growth. And by the way, there's no evidence to support this. I mean, Baumol's key thing is he looks at a, he says, look at orchestras. Orchestras still play music the way they did, you know, 200 years ago, which is fine. But what about things like streaming? And then people actually did time use studies and found out that there are ways to intensify the, ex the use of orchestra labor, which Marx would say intensify exploitation for orchestra workers. You know, but there's also how you broadcast it, how many people fit in the hall, all of those things. So the evidence actually doesn't support the argument that personal services can't increase productivity. Um, and you can see, obviously, in healthcare as well, you can see this vast growth in productivity in terms of both better outputs and the ability to process people relatively fast. And then the second argument, which I think is really one that has a more emotional impact, is that the movement of manufacturing overseas with globalization exposed manufacturing workers in the global north to undercutting but in the process the services generated worse jobs so they were left behind with service jobs which often paid worse and were more insecure in this view um although as i'll show not all service jobs are badly paid in fact in south africa they have the same they're as good as manufacturing jobs by most criteria in the formal sector but the, the argument was 
By moving manufacturing jobs overseas, you leave people to fall back on services, and those services pay worse and are more insecure. Um, I think critical to all of these arguments is how do we measure the socioeconomic impact of services? And I think it's important to note that economic statistics originated mostly to measure, well, initially agriculture, but the really strong development of economic statistics was really about measuring manufacturing, which you can see in the standard industrial categories as well as the trade data. You know, there's 20 different HS categories for, for clothing and textiles, and there's like almost none for services. What has been happening is the international statistical authorities at the UN and the ILO and so on have been, um, and UNCTAD in particular, have been disaggregating the service categories over time. But that very pr process of disaggregation points to the fact that they were not designed to cover services at all. And the actual statistical systems and data collection are really weak, especially on value added and on trade. And I'm assuming um, the next paper will talk more about the trade data. But the thing about value added is that services are often not sold at their market value, um, particularly public goods. So you have education, basic research, healthcare, social security, cultural and social solidarity activities that are often provided by or heavily subsidized by the state. So when we try to measure their value add, we basically, the, what the statistics do is they just look at the cost of production, which is of course not what you're supposed to do when you measure value added. So we don't really even try to capture those externalities that are in there. Um, and the transfer of services across borders, we actually have statistical standards that say things like, if you're an expatriate and you provide services in a foreign country, that should count as an export of your country. Or if you do web design, and you only have, you know, internet contact with your customers in the U.S., that should count as an export, but obviously we don't actually capture those very well. So we capture some of the payments, but we often are not going to capture the full transaction in our trade data. And so I think everybody agrees there's a consistent undercounting of a whole range of services as a result. Particular problem arises out of this when we model the economic impacts of different industries. So value chain analyses, and obviously that means also input output tables, they focus explicitly on how goods have value added as they move through phases of production and how that then affects the GDP investment and employment extrapolated from that. The trouble is many services improve human and social capital. So the product is that we have more productive people and companies and stronger communities. These things are really obviously critical for industrial policy but they're very hard to measure if you look at them as part of the value add or the out impacts of a value chain. So just try and draw, If you, we tried this, you try and do a value chain for education, you know, the product is more educated people. And it, the inputs are skilled people, a few material inputs, and then you have your production stage. I mean, I suppose you could break it down by education phase, but as you can tell, it just doesn't work in the same way when you are improving people's capabilities as when you are moving from you know steel to cars. And I would argue that what that means is that the, our economic model systematically undervalued the multipliers of things like education, healthcare, security, and social solidarity, which are in turn critical for industrialization. And there's a real risk with that. So you look at our industrial policy of South Africa, clearly one of the major factors behind continued inequality and slow growth is that our education systems and working class areas remain totally inadequate. But we've never really said, how do we think about that as part of industrial policy? And how do we think of the education system, which is one of the main employers and producers in the economy, as an economic sector with inputs and outputs, and how do we make sure we get the outputs we need from that? Um, if we look at industrial policy and inclusion, and this is a particular problem for South Africa, obviously, because of our high levels of unemployment and inequality. And one of our problems is we tend to assume we can copy countries in, the, in East Asia where you had high levels of employment at low levels of productivity, particularly in family-owned farming, whereas here we have just people who are unemployed. And I think that makes a whole difference in terms of how the urgency of getting people involved in production and how we link industrialization to improve livelihoods. Um, but also those countries started with very labor intensive manufacturing that we've been unable to get into like clothing and electronics. But in practice, and Donnie Roderick has a very good paper on this now, 
jobs have been created almost exclusively in services since 1995. So the data from the ILO stat and, w and world development indicators, and what you can see that red line is jobs and services, even though the share of services has been stable for the past, whatever that is, 25 years pretty much. Um, I stopped in 2019 to, because COVID obviously messed up all the data. But the share of services has been fairly stable in global GDP, but service jobs have gone up dramatically, while in contrast, both the share of manufacturing and global GDP and employment and manufacturing have tended to decline. And you can see this specifically in China, where agricultural employment dropped from 60% in 1991 to 25% in 2019. But the share of manufacturing and employment, so manufacturing only really absorbed 6% of that that share in, in total employment the fall, of the fall in manufacturing. So manufacturing only went up from 21% to 27%. Most of the difference came from services, which climbed from just under 20% to almost half. So the really big change occurred in services in terms of employment, even though I think we can all agree that growth in the economy was driven by manufacturing, but that was not the main source of jobs growth. So what I also think is important is this, if we look at services as a whole, yes, there are services that do not provide decent work. I mean, there are manufacturing industries that don't provide decent work. But on average in South Africa, paying conditions are on par with manufacturing in the formal sector, services are knowledge intensive, they are critical for building human and social capital and national competitiveness. And by the way, they're particularly important for women, except for the professional business services in South Africa, which are very much dominated still by white men. But I think one of the things that happens is when we focus just on manufacturing, we're actually largely excluding women's work um, in a way which I think is really is based on the idea that women's work is just not as important. And so to me, part of the services debate comes down to saying, how do we think about jobs as opposed to productivity? How do we think about prioritizing jobs sustainably? Like, what are the activities where we can actually generate more employment in a way that is sustainable and constructive for society? Rather than saying our sole focus should be on high-tech industries and how we raise productivity there so we can be internationally competitive in those subsectors, when we know that's not going to make sure that our industrialization is increasingly inclusive, and that industrialization won't succeed unless South Africa becomes more inclusive and more equitable. So just some data, you know, these are in South Africa, employment creation by services. And what you can see is, you know, the cleaning and security jobs leveled out and got very hard hit by COVID, although they've somewhat recovered. But um, on the other end of the scale, health and education have tended to increase employment quite rapidly. And those are highly, you know, very obviously very decent work, mostly professionals employed, um, and very stable work, admittedly largely, but not, although not exclusively in the public sector. And the private professional services, excluding health and education, have also tended to grow. What hasn't grown, despite our perceptions since 2008, is that retail has tended to pretty much stagnate. And so has catering and accommodation, which is, of course, driven by tourism, and logistics has also been flat. So really, the growth has been at the top and the low end of the services. But I don't think you can just generalize and say services only create lousy jobs. And then particularly, you know, that in the last, from around 2015 to around 2020. If you look at the median income, um, what you can see is that the services on the whole, um, in the formal sector, and this is only formal sector, pretty much pay as well as other goods production, including manufacturing. And some of them, obviously, where you have high, the professional services actually do better, and they are major employers. I don't think we should underestimate that. And particularly, like I said, health and education are incredibly important employers for women with a degree. Um, and I think, you know, with all the problems within those sectors, they generate very good work for people who otherwise tend to be excluded from the private sector. So what are, briefly, what are the implications for industrial policy? You know, I think it's important to say these are the main source of employment creation and opportunities for small business already. But also the gaps in services are often a critical constraint on economic diversification. If you're a small business and you can't get skilled workers, you can't get affordable health care for your workers, you can't get 
affordable logistics, you can't get finance, you can't get design support or engineering, then you're going to find it much harder to, to establish yourself and to grow. Um, even if you're a large business, those things can be major constraints, and they are major constraints in much of South Africa. But also, I think we shouldn't underestimate the importance of social capital, that the services are often critical for equality and social solidarity. And there's, you know, industrialization doesn't function where there's endless contestation because you don't have social solidarity and you have profound inequalities as in South Africa. And just to be clear, again, the key service industries, professional and business services, which are both technical and management support. And by the way, when we, people say man, value adding services, that's actually largely what defines value adding services in the technical definition. But they're also human capital development, education and training and healthcare, creative services and hospitality, logistics and retail and cleaning and security. And I think we should have strategies for all of these sectors. In practice, we have master plans for the creative industries. And someplace there is in theory, a master plan for business process services and for tourism, but it ha they haven't been published. At least I can't find them on the web. So in other words, what that shows is our failure to think about how the services fit into our industrial policy in a consistent way. What we need to succeed, you know, a lot of this is industrial policy 101, but applied to the services. You know, so we need sector strategies to start with saying, what more could the main service industries do to promote inclusive industrialization? Where are the gaps? but being realistic about it. So there's no point saying, you know, we want to triple the number of university graduates if we're never going to get there immediately. But we could start saying, how do we get there over time? Because just by the way, South Africa still lags behind in university graduates and it, the number of graduates is actually not growing faster than in other countries. Um, and then we have to say, what are the factors that prevent us from reaching those, those objectives, those outcomes and impacts and say, what are targeted and realistic and efficient measures to address the constraints that prevent us from getting there? So those binding constraints again. One big difference from goods production is that the public sector does tend to be more important in the services. And we need to start thinking about how do we think about that when we do industrial policy in sectors like, for instance, for healthcare and education, so that we don't lose the externalities that are critical. Um, by just focusing on the private sector, but that we also ensure that, you know, we actually do more to ensure that the outcomes meet the needs of inclusive industrialization. And I would argue that we need to learn from the successes, but also from the failures of the master plans. We need to start by saying, what are government aims? And then we need to engage much more with stakeholders on how to achieve them. Um, what doesn't work is to have government come in and steamroll everybody, but it also doesn't work if government goes in without a clear vision and ends up just doing whatever they get lobbied to do. So we need to say, how do we manage that process better for services as for manufacturing? I do think it does also underlying this is that we need to rethink the aims and instruments of industrial policy to adapt it to South African realities. So the critical thing is, how do we balance inclusivity, which is jobs and small business support with growth? that there may be cases where um, you can have sustainable growth in jobs and small business, which is not necessarily globally competitive in some abstract sense, but which is protected by distance or by the ability to meet local needs or so on. And we need to think about how can we do that on a scale large enough to overcome the inequalities and joblessness, which are particularly high in South Africa. I mean, in South Africa, 40% of the population is employed compared to 60% in the rest of the world. So I would argue industrial policy has, we have to think much more about what kind of industrial policy would help us fill that gap in a way that is sustainable and viable. But the second thing, and I think this also appears on the master plan issues, how do we ensure that we are actually promoting industries based on South African needs in a way that's more flexible? Because the risk is that we've got existing structures and capacity for some sectors and not for others. And there's business lobbies for some sectors and not for others. And if we want to actually make a systematic shift to priorities generally, but specifically in the services, we need to think about what are the structures in government that can drive that effectively? And how do we avoid just being lobbied by industries that are facing some kind of disaster? And we end up using our industrial policy to rescue them 
rather than taking a long-term view about what is the end state we want to get to and how do we choose priorities against that end state. So thank you very much. And I um, would be interested in comments. Huh. Thank you, Nida. Um, thanks very much for the input. I propose we go into the second input and then we'll have the discussion and the questions there after. Professor Chiro and Dr. Tarek, are you ready? I'm going to kick off, then Justin will take over and then I'll come back at, at the end. So thanks very much for the opportunity to uh, participate in this uh, webinar uh, this afternoon. Uh, Never's paper is extremely interesting and a very important paper. It's long overdue. The discussion of the role of services in economic development is long overdue. So encourage everybody to read it, to share it with your colleagues, and to discuss and debate it, because it's very significant. We really congratulate NEVA on the historical analysis and uh, looking at the uh, traditional conceptualization of, of services, which is really interesting and of course the very wide-ranging analysis that she presents in the paper and that she only touched on actually this afternoon she has looked at the data the evidence in more detail than anybody else she has interrogated different data sources that i didn't know existed on trade employment productivity small business wages race and she's demonstrated very co convincingly how important services are to jobs, particularly for women, to small business, and indirectly as inputs to other industries, to human capital, that's a very interesting and important new argument, to social capital as well, that's another important and new argument. The global perspective, putting South Africa in a wider context, looking at the historical changes over time, these are all extremely important insights from the paper. And then finally, the uh, openness and the ideological um, non-conformity, I think, is to be applauded. The lack of bias and preconceptions that have traditionally uh, associate, been associated with discussions of the role of services. So we hope the paper will be taken very seriously. And in the spirit of debating the paper, we want to focus on two themes from our own research that we think are neglected, somewhat neglected by Neva in her paper and are worthy of further development. Firstly, we want to discuss how we unpack the different kinds of contributions that different services make to the economy. And secondly, we want to talk about the spatial dimension of services uh, because this is almost completely neglected by the paper. And the different, the uneven and different contribution that services in different places make to the economy. We must disaggregate this will be our second uh, proposition. So without further ado, let me hand over to Justin. Thanks, Arvin. Um, I'll just continue, but shout if you can't hear me or there's an issue. Um, <clears throat> so as mentioned, we've done work in this area. Um, I've included some working papers uh, that you can look up, look into after the slides. But the spirit, mid spirit is very much as a complement to what Neva's just um, presented, and we hope we can sort of sharpen this really important um, discussion about the role of services. I think a key issue is: can we get greater clarity on the role of services in the rest of the economy? Um, and one one question that uh, is apparent is. Our service is merely a pathway to inclusion and um, Neva makes a very strong argument for how um, uh, services can do so um, because of their uh, role in gender, in race, SMMEs, um, uh, wages at least at the same level. Um, some really striking evidence about the way in which uh, the service industry can help inclusion. But is this a necessary addition to industrial policy because of the jobs and social uh, implications? Um, or can it have more to do with structural transformation of the economy itself? Um, we'd also like to pose the question, how is inclusive industrialization really different from inclusive economic development? Um, is there something different between this, uh, um, uh, the focus on inclusive industrialization uh, versus the usual talk for the economy as a whole? At the end of it is, 
what is the direction and strength of the relationship between services with the rest of the economy so i think we're hear a lot about services supporting industrial policy but this still suggests somewhat of a subordinate relationship or a dependency on manufacturing and at the end of this presentation what we we hope to show and hope to add is to say that services are extremely diverse so it, we can't generalize when trying to answer these questions different sorts of sectors can play different sorts of role whether they essentially are uh, more of a, a, a social role in terms of its jobs or where, whether it can be seen legitimately as part of manufactured value chains. So the to start off, the traditional or narrow view of services is, is how services are usually characterized. And it's worth just visiting this quickly um, uh, in the sense of, of um, recognizing that uh, services are are no, can no longer be easily characterized in this way. So traditionally services have been seen as non-tradable. Non-tradable in the sense that they depend on local demand or domestic consumption. So another word for it would be locally tradable. Um, part of the reason for this is that services are often more complex in the production and consumption process and consumption and production often need to occur in the same place physically. So this uh, presents a limit on the scope of, of the size of the market that can be accessed because physically you need that proximity. So this is the, this idea of, of services being limited by uh, um, their, their reach of, of market. The other aspect of, of services is that they're often seen as labor intensive tasks and can have a, a great degree of, of sort of complexity in the delivery of of production so this requires adaptation it requires customization to what the particular need is it requires a lot of interaction in terms of a two-way communication between producer and consumer um, this is the the sort of softer element to the way in which um, uh, service activities are often delivered delivered and this means that they can be hard to standardize simplify and therefore scale up and these are key components historically of raising productivity that you're able to sort of compartmentalize and uh, standardize tasks um, and, and, and in that way scale up and, and increase productivity. So a classic characteristic a characterization would be if you're in the restaurant business or catering services, um, it's hard to imagine how that restaurant business can really grow other than continuing to expand its its physical footprints and maybe physically establishing other branches but it's inherently related and constrained to its local context on the other side of the scale would be the, the agro processing of the food right and the advantage there is that if, if you're not selling the um, uh, or serving the, the meals if you're actually part of the production process of producing the the um, uh, you know the value-added fruit or what what the, the inputs you can see that now you're no longer constrained to your restaurant but actually that agro processing has much uh, more potential for scalability for reaching other markets so this is the sort of traditional narrow view of services but conditions for manufacturing and services have been changing and Neva's already uh, made a good case for that uh, in in the previous presentation so i'll quickly touch on some of these points one of them is the dominance of China and its neighbors in manufacturing. Uh, it, many uh, low income and middle income countries have struggled to industrialize, um, not just South Africa. We just need to look into Latin, Latin America too, partly because of the strength of the East Asian um, uh, producers. And so there's not the same degree of space or opportunity today as what there might have been in the past. So it's hard to, it's been hard for, for countries to follow this industrial model. Another key dimension has been the way in which new technology and automation have been particularly dis disruptive for the manufacturing process. It's increasingly more capital intensive. It means it's creating fewer and fewer jobs globally. And Neva already showed us again that services have been creating jobs over the last decade, not even manufacturing when it's growing in value added. So it's becoming in harder and harder for industrialization to deliver um, on uh, jobs globally. We've also seen the growth of global and regional value, value chains where just-in-time supply make other activities really important. 
um, how do you access these markets in terms of the quality of your infrastructure? What about the financial services that uh, go in so to, to make sure that uh, these big infrastructure builds, we think of China's influence on, on the continent in terms of building bridges and roads. It's often about bringing together all these different uh, enabling services uh, and, and that's changing the nature uh, of production across the globe. New digital technologies, perhaps the most disruptive of all, uh, COVID-19 being a catalyst for e-commerce, we see health and education, or uh, sorry, education in particular, online learning. Um, and there's an increasing variety of different sorts of new services um, that are changing the way we think about the way in which um, uh, production and consumption can occur. Think of Uber and the taxi industry, take a lot in retail door-to-door -door courier this is your traditional um, logistics so in trying to make sense of this changing landscape we would like to propose that there are three key dimensions that will help us conceptualize service activities more clearly and help us make sure that we're not using too much of a broad brush stroke to put all services together but actually differentiate between different sorts of contributions that can be made by different sorts of activities and sectors the one is around tradability the second is its role in the value chain. And the third being the sophistication in production. So in terms of sophistication in production, they're clearly very different types of services when you compare the routine security or cleaning services to the very complex and high skill um, of, uh, um, uh, IT or software services, or for instance, in the built environment, industrial uh, architecture and design uh, services. So the distinction between the sort of typical low value add, um, a low wage service industry only characterizes a very uh, one type of segment, right? There are clearly other segments of the service industry that are very different. So we think the sophistication in production some between routine and complex or maybe low value added and high value added is really important for us to try and conceptualize these different services activities and this relates to different dimensions of the inputs from the capital intensity to the level of skill low skill versus high skill um, and e even in terms of uh, the markets that can be reached second dimension is that of tradability which i've already spent some time talking about Inherent within this is this key question of can services grow without the industrial base expanding? And I think answering this question comes down again to what sort of service industry are we talking about? Locally traded or non-tradable services will always be following after the industrial base. They're largely dependent on domestic demand. Of course, the plus, and Neva's referred to this, is the potential for job creation because jobs are uh, protected or sheltered. They can only be produced uh, with physical pro proximity uh, locally, this creates scope um, for, for more jobs. But it does inherently limit the potential for growth into the future. Um, we, uh, <clears throat> so the example of the restaurant or the local barber or hairdresser, uh, we, and health and education to a large extent. On the other end of the extreme would be what we might characterize as sort of export services. This is where services can be completely tradable because of the way in which digitalization is transforming um, uh, service production. Producers can now reach directly into foreign markets using the internet um, uh, and using uh, advances in, in international travel. Of course, these sorts of export high value added services are more skill intensive and don't have the advantages for job multipliers um, and job creation and, and the social role as the locally tradable services. And there's somewhere in between we have intermediate sorts of activities which can be fairly tr tradable and have some of the pros and cons of both worlds. I think transport services is perhaps an example here where um, there is some degree of, degree of tradability, but it does get constrained by the quality of the road and infrastructure networks. Um, financial services too, increasingly tradable, but of always constrained by needing to properly understand the uh, regulatory environment um, and the regulation and control. So um, clearly the degree of tradability uh, is, can vary and is important for us to think about across these different types of activities. And then the last is the role in the value, value chain of, of services. And we see 
two broad distinctions that are worth um, uh, highlighting. One might be services as an enabler or a network activity. This is the cross-cutting role that services often play across all industries and all sectors. So industrialization needing to be efficient has to depend upon the uh, trans the quality of the transport uh, network. Um, and we've seen uh, many examples, if we think of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, you know, key for it taking off, it ultimately does come down to some investments that are needed in making border posts more efficient and connecting, uh, up upgrading the, infra uh, the quality of the infrastructure. And so for industrialization, for manufacturers to grow, you know, we need efficient transport services. ESCOM is another classic example. Uh, energy feeding into all sectors, all industries across the board, and it imposes serious liability and bottlenecks if it's not delivered appropriately. So services are often a grease within the overall system and play this network role. But we'd also like to highlight, and, and Nevo touched on this, that services themselves have been changing, and sometimes they are as much part of the manufacturing process as as product um, and difficult to exclude them or not see them as part of production so they become embedded within the manufactured products themselves as a direct input in the value chain so uh, r d of the of the uh, product design um, uh, the efficiency of combining the capital and the labor, so the management, consulting, and uh, uh, can lead to productivity increases. Um, the branding and marketing, getting uh, the logistics, sorry, not the logistics, the branding and marketing in terms of um, uh, uh, creating value in terms of, of uh, communicating what the products mean to the, to the consumers. All of these have become integral in the manufacturing process. and. What we have seen is an era of fragmentation of manufacturing production. So as manufacturing has become more productive, a lot of these components, which used to be internal to many manufacturing firms, are now outsourced to services. And so it, it would be um, uh, short-sighted not to see the opportunity of these service sorts of activities as directly part of the industrial uh, value chain. Lead service M&Es, neither um, uh, touched on this, have a unique role in terms of command and control. And, and, and they generally tend to do with services. So production of, for instance, uh, textiles and clothing, we can think of Nike and Adidas, no longer in the global north is the production located there, but still the design, the R&D for the sorts of running shoes, or, or um, we can think of these sorts of examples, and the marketing, the branding gets retained. Or sometimes it's the technology itself that then gets uh, dispersed with pay patents. So we can see that there's a direct input into these value chains as part of manufacturing, and, and these sorts of service activities are very valuable and, and clearly can create um, uh, um, and can lead development within an economy. Services here often become exports themselves, and digital being the clearest example. So combining these three different dimensions together, and uh, this is not, uh, by no means exhaustive, we might want to try and grapple with other ways or other dimensions to make better sense of a very heterogeneous service economy. But combining these three things together, um, we think that perhaps the different service sectors can be put into these three different um, broad categories. One being non-tradable domestic services. So these are your conventional, narrowly defined um, uh, retail and tourism and uh, health education, which are, are, have, have conventionally been seen as services. The second um, category would be what we'd like to call long-established tradable services. This is all, all your sort of traditional um, uh, service sectors. Still fairly low skill inten intensive, um, but increasingly can be delivered remotely. Uh, the transport uh, and where warehousing, um, and they have probably have modest transport formative potential for the rest of the economy. And then the third being um, more um, uh, modern developments and services, what we'd like to call contemporary tradable services. So these would be highly trade traded, but also depend on high levels of skill and knowledge and intensity. So the professional scientific, scientific technical engineering services. Um, and Ivan's going to talk to it shortly um really important in terms of uh the 
the agglomeration and uh, the local clusters in particular cities and places. In thinking about these three different categories, an important tension comes to the fore immediately, and that is that there's a difference between those service sectors which can raise productivity in the rest of the economy and even lead economic development by, control, by controlling these lead activities in global value chains. So this would be your contemporary tradable services versus those that can play the inclusive role with job creation and reducing poverty. This would be your non-tradable um, uh, domestic services. But very different sorts of activities and I think useful for us to distinguish between them. I'm going to have to gloss over some of this next section to just uh, leave enough time for Ivan to conclude. But I think it's uh, worth pointing out that we've done some interesting research on the potential for service exports directly. So um, focusing on the, on the latter, um, uh, both long established uh, services and the contemporary tradable um, uh, services, um, which are now um, increasingly becoming a feature of global trade. Um, Neva mentioned that part of the difficulty in highlighting uh, the potential to serve direct service exports is that the statistical systems don't capture them particularly well. Um, and that's part and parcel of the fact that services are delivered in a more complex way. It's not just as you know, producing it, packing it in a box and sending it over a border. But the WTO actually recognized four different ways in which the services can actually be delivered. The cross-border supply would be your conventional, I'm in my country, you're in your country, and it crosses the border. The internet being the way in which this is conventionally happens. So your web de de developer being able to de deliver their service um, over the internet. But you also get consumption abroad where someone might travel from another country into South Africa to receive that service. Healthcare tourism is something that's often cited in this mode of, of delivery. A third mode would be a commercial presence. So this is where you actually establish a branch elsewhere to enable that delivery to take place. And the fourth being um, the movement of uh, the producer into the foreign country. So an IT firm who might be delivering a software to another firm might, as part of that process, send their analyst over into the foreign market for a period in terms of producing that. So four different ways, and this complicates it. And most importantly, the WTO do not currently measure this third mode of commercial presence. And the OECD predict or, or they estimate that this can be as much as 50% of the exports of services going on. So the huge undercounting, if if our conventional trade custom statistics aren't counting 50%, i.e. through the physical delivery of services by establishing foreign affiliates. I'm going to skip over this slide because I have run out of time and just this is the last slide from me. And it's just to say that when we looked at uh, the latest uh, World Bank Enterprise Survey, which was di directly interviewing firms and asking them about the way in which they delivered their their goods and their services. They had an interesting question, which was not only are you an exporter, but they then followed it up and said, does this particular establishment have a foreign affiliate or a, or a branch elsewhere in Africa? And you can see how the statistics dramatically change. So for manufacturing, it was 20% of firms who said they were directly involved in exporting. Whereas in terms of those who had some form of foreign uh, subsidiary in another uh, established elsewhere, it rose to 31%. So clearly a little bit of undercounting even for manufacturing firms if you consider the role of, it, of investment in other countries and establishing a physical presence. But when it comes to services, this becomes so much more important. 8% of South African service firms in the enterprise survey said they were directly involved in exports. But as much as 27% of them said that they had some foreign branch or subsidiary. So clearly there could be a lot of undercounting or in terms of hidden exports going on from South Africa um, in the service economy. And we think potential, uh, much more potential for, for growth. Um, there are, of course, significant barriers to do so. You can see the headlines there of many service firms struggling in the rest of African markets. So the message here for the DTIC and other role players to consider is perhaps service firms would be more successful if they were supported in their international trade efforts. It's clearly tough going in the rest of Africa. And I think the African Continental Free Trade Agreement with its services protocol clearly flags the, the potential um, for us 
thinking about direct service exports on the rest of the continent. So over to Ivan. So just a few minutes. Dimension neglected by this important paper is the spatial dimension. It's particularly important for the relationship between services and the rest of the economy, which is the focus of our remarks. These relationships are rooted in place and they're extremely uneven in South Africa. This is all very, very obvious. The education, the quality of education, training, work experience, healthcare, and the impact on human capital is so obviously very unequal and uneven in the country that it needs, we need to think about it. We need to talk about it and not uh, uh, gloss over it. Similarly, the uneven distribution of social and recreational amenities, cultural facilities, and all these other services that Neva has talked about are so important. Their impact on social capital similarly is very unequally distributed across, across the country. So if human capital matter, if social capital matter, we got to recognize that they are unequally distributed across the country. And that is applies perhaps even more so when it comes to talking about these dynamic, sophisticated, high level services uh, of knowledge intensity, where there's sensitive information uh, shared between providers and users, where there's tacit knowledge, in other words, something that you cannot um, codify, you can't write down. So it depends on in-person communication. The responsiveness of service providers to the demands of business, right, or to the demands of, of, of users. Uh, all these things are critical and uneven in geography. They depend on interaction, they depend on proximity, on human contact, and they, and this is a spatial process that we need to think about harder than the paper suggests. So the outcome of this is that economic dynamism is unequal across the territory of the country. It depends on these detailed, intense human and business interactions within cities in particular, the clustering, the ecosystems. These are different words to describe this process of intense interaction that happens in some places, but not in others. It requires access to specialized skills, to special technology, sophisticated information, experienced service providers, uh, uh, advanced infrastructure, digital and other uh, infrastructure. So this is critical uh, because it's also linked to other intangible issues around confidence, trust and predictability in investment decisions that are, are, are so important to economic devel development and industrialization. So there are positive dynamics there that uh, tend to occur in cities, uh, but cities also have big problems and obstruct some of these really important dynamics, right? So obvious physical blockages is one example to interaction, integration, uh, inclusion, uh, transport, spatial planning, the gap between housing and jobs in our uh, very unequal cities that we have to think about too, because they undermine the positive synergies, the externalities that never talked about, uh, and the building of capabilities, which is so important for economic development. So the next slide, um, globalization and technology are beginning to change some of these dynamics. And there are books being published saying the world is flat, uh, you know, e-commerce and the digital economy is doing away with geography. Uh, and there certainly are some trends here. I won't go into the detail, but putting it simply, um, professional services and other forms of um, advanced services are being globalized and um, internationalized through major powerful uh, corporations and consultancies and partnerships. This is leading to the takeover of domestic firms. Governments also tend to in interfere and regulate these advanced services more than they do other sectors of the economy for reasons of safety, of security, of s maintaining standards, and of protecting strategic interests of countries. Governments are heavily involved in regulating these sectors, although there are some trends towards liberalization, deregulation, uh, and so on. 
They have powerful pro professional associations, which is partly why governments respond with regulation. And there are certainly strategic interests here. Just the recent discussion of South African Airways, the government's decision to uh, not to privatize, but to retain it and to bail it out and so on, because it's regarded as having this special kind of role. So um, the impact of this is if South African service providers want to export, they will need to think harder about joint ventures and partnerships with other local companies, rather than just thinking they can go it alone. And the next slide, Justin. So the implications of a policy of the spatial dimension is that we need to think about geography as well as the sectoral and value chain perspective on services. Issues of coordination between knowledge, infrastructure, training and skills and, and the agendas of business. These require a local a spatial uh, perspective to, to, to bring these together. The place-based policies are critical to make the connections for functional labor markets, housing markets, property markets, and other ecosystems or clusters of uh, business expertise and business uh, specialization between land, infrastructure, finance, skills, and intangibles. This a place-based policy can add a great deal to a sectoral policy, but it requires strong local institutions to complement the sectoral organizations and the master plans that we have, are developing for joined up decision making in the places that make functional sense to the economy. Also thinking about the future, we know our cities are growing strongly. We can't just plan for particular sectors, we have to think about the physical dimensions of what's happening on the ground. And I'll move on to the last slide. To sum up then, the contribution of services to the economy is extremely diverse and heterogeneous. So it's very hard to generalize and say that services, you know, are critical per se to industrial policy. They make a different direct contribution to jobs. Some are more important than others, a different contribution to enterprise and livelihoods. So the inclusion agenda. And of course, they make a very different contribution indirectly through productivity, technology, innovation to the growth agenda. We think that the distinction between tradable and non-tradable is really important, but not made in the paper sufficiently uh, clearly. It's crucial to growth. Tradable services could make a bigger contribution to the economy than non-tradables. They can grow in their own right without industrialization effectively, although they would benefit if, if there was a synergy and a complementarity going on. Third point, routine enablers of growth are different from the dynamic the advanced, the high value, the sophisticated inputs that Justin talked about to other sectors. We think that distinction is really important. The routine versus those that are making a kind of ongoing and uh, a, 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 a increasing input to the rest of the economy. Just transport versus digital maybe would be a simple distinction there. And then finally, the spatial or place-based uh, perspective is critically important to complement the sectoral or value chain approach. Firstly, to understand the variable contribution of services, why in some places they're much more significant than in others, and of course, for effective policy action. Coordination, I've emphasized, responsiveness to the needs of business and industry, better, best at the local level, and for mobilizing partners. I think that's something we haven't talked much about, but if government is not just to act alone, but is to try to form you know, partnerships with stakeholders that uh, work together to address our big challenges that is best done at a sub-national level rather than a national level, I would argue, or at least in addition to the national level. Thanks very much. Thanks, Professor and Dr. Pizarro, for a very thought provoking input. And I guess some of the contracts that we are looking forward to relation to the input already made by uh, there are a couple of questions that have been posed on the chat. First, let me ask the kids' colleagues, is 4 o'clock our hard stop? Um, I'm worried about time. I think we're only there for 10 minutes. Um, I want to suggest something different. If 4 o'clock is our hard stop time, I would propose that um, maybe let's take one or two questions from the floor uh, while I allow the panelists to read up the questions.
we'll find another mechanism to say bigger questions so to avoid uh, leaving them uh, in the chat uh, so that we don't, uh, you know, the conversation does, doesn't become uh, between the panelists and myself. Can I just allow one or two questions from uh, the chat um, if people can raise their hands? And in the meantime, can you just find time to read the questions that have been put on the chat and see how we can best uh, respond? Any, any questions? Hi, Chair. Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, I'm able to hear. Thank you very much. And thank you for the session. It's been um, always incredibly uh, informative. And I think also the fact of building more awareness around the services and tertiary sector is something that's also much needed. And I think maybe one question I have is is more on the ends. I'm actually from Wesco, the uh, Western Cape's Trade and Investment Promotion Agency. And we actually have a trading services desk internally. And we are also focusing on, you know, how can we kind of look at export opportunities and services, especially from the Western Cape, as a large amount of our employment and economic drivers comes from the tertiary sector, actually. And um, one thing that we we definitely are struggling with is actually uncovering a lot of services data as it's very immature. Um, and I think also from a product point of view, if we're looking at what's been done from an HS code level, even ITC trade map in looking at market destination for goods, it's easy to see growth opportunities, trends on that database. But we, but for services, it's again, it's incredibly difficult. And um, I mean, we rely a lot on the OECD um, direction where we just kind of re re uh, not reinvent the wheel, but we look at their opportunities and try and apply it to what we possess in terms of our sectors. And also another way we do it is we look at a product basis and see, you know, what services may come out of there in terms of exports, but what do you think can be done to unlock on a more data approach for services, not just for trade, but to actually see locally because, you know, the SA Reserve Bank, SARS, balance of payment, EBOPs, uh, you know, they all have a role to play in collecting that data. And where do you think that data should sit? Who should be organizing that? And also, who do you think should actually be distributing that information? Because, Again, if you want to take this to the next level and actually really start seeing how we can set strong policy, not just on a domestic level, but also trade and international level, we need this data and this accessibility. Otherwise, I, again, it, we can't keep going company by company and collecting and harvesting information. We'll be here for a very long time and lose out competitively. So how can we get those that are sitting with the data in the right room and who can be the body to kind of facilitate that data point to organize it and then obviously put it across. I'm not sure who can take that on, so maybe you can help me with that, Chair. Thanks, Mr. Palm. Um, uh, Neva, um, can I put you on the spot and give you the opportunity to respond first? Okay, and can I respond to some of the other questions as well that are in the text? Yes, yes, you can. Cool. Thanks. Okay, so, um, so uh, look, the data problem is a long-term problem. And I think there, there's there's two issues, really. One is that the way we define exports or services, as um, Justin was kind of saying, is that the, 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 if a South African entity or person provides a service while they are based overseas, that actually counts as an export. But it's, you know, how much monitoring do we want to do of people's activities when they're overseas? So really, I think the Reserve Bank, I have always assumed, and we should talk to them probably, has relied more on transfer, you know, how the payments are made and the income flows to reflect the exports of services. And there's two problems with that. One is that if you've read their data on income flows, it's quite confusing. And I think the category should probably be reviewed to say, how can we separate out payments for services other than logistics more systematically? And the second problem is, of course, um, people are going to try and understate those payments for tax purposes. And also, that for that reason, they might, for instance, set up an account overseas so they don't have to deal with taxes here. So I think it's it's this is a case of taking a system that was designed to do one thing, which is count goods and try and to deal with exchange controls and try and say, how would we have to transform it to count revenues from services? Because when we look at exports, that's probably the most important thing we want to look at. So what are the factor payments um, and how does that relate to the export of services? How do we think about that? So right now, factor payments are not included in exports of services. And yet in terms of the actual statistical system internationally, they probably should be, but nobody does it. And that's the kind of incongruence we'd have to deal with. 
I don't think it's easy. I think that this thing of saying who has affiliates overseas is a very interesting way of thinking about it. Um, but it's 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 going to be an ongoing problem, and I don't think we can deal with it um, in the short run easily at all, um, to be blunt. In terms of some of the other questions, um, some of them are comments. Um, you know, I think that the, the thing about vulnerability of services to COVID, I mean, I think that's a bit of a red herring because you can't build your entire economy around um, concerns about exogenous factors that you can't really predict easily. Also, most services were not that affected. You know, healthcare actually grew, obviously, and a lot of biosciences grew. Um, so I think that's really this thing that in people's minds, they tend to reduce services to personal services. Um, you know, and a lot of personal services, yes, we could do more about infection control. If it becomes necessary, we could prepare for that. But, you know, that's like saying, how come the auto industry didn't anticipate the disruptions to their supply chains during COVID? You know, if we hadn't had that, then we would be in better shape in the auto industry as well. You know, um, so I, I think that's, again, it's interesting that there's this profound sometimes not very evidence-based reaction to the services as a problem. And the assumption that South Africa is somehow unique in the high share of services when it's it's a bit more service dependent than other upper middle in income countries, but it's not that much more. And the other countries are catching up fast. So I think, you know, we should rather be looking at it as the previous paper did in terms of what are the specific costs and benefits of different activities without saying, well, because they're in a particular sector, you know, somehow they're not as good. Um, the one other comment I want to make, though, which arises out of several of these comments is, um, you know, I think there are two questions here. And I think it came up also clearly in the previous paper, which is, there's a question of what are we trying to do with industrial policy in South Africa? And how important is the inclusive part of that? And how important is the international competitiveness and promoting internationally competitive industries part of that? And how do they relate? And I think there is a tendency to act like industrial policy should focus on the top end of the formal sector and somebody else will somehow deal with the issues of joblessness and um, asset and income inequality in the rest of the economy, or we'll just do that through government redistribution while we somehow find a way to go the top end of the formal sector. And I would argue that that's fine, but then be clear about you're doing that and that that's not actually a question of services because as the previous paper pointed out, the services can absolutely fit into the idea that we want to build world-class, world-competitive industries as the way to drive growth. Um, but I would argue that we, this is what I was trying to say, that we also need to rethink our industrial policy process if we want a sustainable industrial policy, because as long as the benefits of industrialization don't reach the majority, then we're, and I think that Ivor's points about regional disparities are really important. As long as the, we don't reach the majority with our industrial policy, then there's not actually a sound political basis to support it. And what we see is that, you know, when there are budget cuts, when there's changes in policy, if we end up with a coalition government, there won't be the kinds of support we want for industrial policy. And, and we could really end up with an even weaker system there. Thanks. Thanks, Miba. Um, Professor Chow and uh, the panel. Any reflections on your side? on the questions on the chat. I, I hope you have had the time to really take up with I think some really important questions have uh, been discussed here. I think the, the, the question of what are the what's the purpose of industrial policy is is really, really important that Neva is, is raising here. Uh, what are the objectives? Uh, what's the balance of objectives? Um, you know, we don't see much, much discussion of that. Um, and it does depend very much uh, you know, what the answer is depends on what the sector priorities, what the spatial priorities are. We we fudge these issues and we, we end up with, you know, weak policies as a result, I would say, particularly in terms of uh, spatial policies like special economic zones, which are very much a compromise and don't, don't actually achieve uh, very much at all. So I think it's good to ask that question. What are we trying to achieve? Um... The data problems are, are, are enormous in services, and uh, we've been struggling in our research to get access to the better data, try and find better data sources. We're looking at, as Justin showed, this enterprise survey as a, as a potential uh, source, but it's it's uh, you know not a very large sample, and 
there are some questions about reliability of it. Um, so it requires further it requires further work on this. And I would say my, my key point would be that you know we need to the starting point is to raise the significance of services. When when we persuade the powers that be, whether it's the Reserve Bank or or government DTIC or whatever, that services are more important than they've assumed been assumed to be in the past, then we will it will follow that we can get a better discussion of improvements to data. Um, it's critical, particularly the trade the trade data, which is really weak on services. So that's that's enough for me. Thanks. Well, sure, most of the. Uh questions are really comments um and i'm i'm happy with how neva and ivan have responded um i think the data issue and, and needing a solid evidence base is is a really good one to raise here um and i think that it you know it doesn't just apply to the question of services it, for westgro it also applies to the quality of of any local spatial information which sectors in your economy are, are growing or not um you know one quick win could be can you just track employment at a very detailed sectoral level? Um, you won't know how that links into international trade or not, but I, I think that clearly um, if you have enough disaggregation of service activities and you can track employment numbers in your, in your locality, I think that's probably one of the, the reliable places to start. We've been doing interesting work with tax data to spatialize it, so I, I can put a link in the chat there. Um, but I agree that raising this issue of of getting an evidence base is, is really important. Perhaps the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and the services protocol as part of that um, broader discussion might be a way to start piggybacking on some of these um, measurement reforms. But Neva's highlighted that uh, it is tricky to measure services compared to manufactured goods just because the modes of delivery aren't so straightforward. How do you find these foreign affiliates? How do you measure what components of their trade are relevant to the uh, parent organization. Um, I think it is realistically a long-term reform process. Uh, but th thank you very much for hearing us out, everybody. It was, it was great to be here. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Pizarra. I'm tempted to give the room one last opportunity for a short question. I hope it's going to be very short, uh, not to regret my kindness. Uh, Let's see, is, does anybody have got a very short question that they would like to put forward? No, I was asking the opportunities that there are in terms of uh, South Africa's industrial policy, given that 67% of the GDP comes from the tertiary sector. We usually interchangeably use tertiary sector and services sector uh, almost as the same. I, I don't know if the, the if either of the papers sort of captured it. I, I, the debate around the certification of industrialization, the unbundling of production poses and presents opportunities that SA can tap into. Are there implications for South Africa's industrial policy moving that sectoral contribution to take advantage of the global nature of, of, of production and manufacturing for the time being? I, I don't know if that was a summarized version of the question. I can have a go if you'd like, Chair. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, so one of the papers we've written that you might want to have a look at is called, um, uh, for you and you wide, it was called in Building Malls or Metros. Um, and uh, it essentially is looks at this question of Africa's urbanization, the need for, um, uh, you know, massive infrastructure investment over the, you know, coming decades. Um, and particularly its role in improving connectivity and access to market. Um, but there are a lot of services in that process in terms of the built environment, in terms of the planning for the roads and the rail um, and the um, uh, physical investments, the architectural um, design, the engineering um, and construction related to that. So, I mean, clearly there's a massive potential with the sorts of skill set that South Africa does have in terms of our quality um, of built environment that we can uh, have, have proven to, to produce. And yet, you know, most of the um, uh, uh, headlines are around what China is doing in the rest of Africa. So um, I think that that's clearly an, an area of opportunity is uh, the inherent urbanization in Africa and the sorts of built environment services that, that we produce, um, I think, is also developmental. So it's a win-win uh, in terms of our role on the continent. Um, but. I think the, the, the message from, from this seminar is, 
you know, we need to take services seriously and as part of that process, look at these value chains. Um, uh, and because it is case by case, it's not a silver bullet, um, but there certainly is more, there is potential in the service in, uh, sector and, and how do we maxi maximize that? And that does require the hard research and work of um, analyzing um, uh, dif different opportunities. Um, thanks. Thanks, Justin. I think many people have on the point you just made now that in the context of in the context of the continental free trade area, um, I wonder if in our policy discussion we are having a discussion on how do we how do we position South African services to be a bigger contributor into the continental free trade um, as a tradable service coming from South Africa. If you look at the what we have looked forward is in about how do we protect or provide an opportunity for our productive sectors. So that's where the biggest conversation on the gone. And really in the context of today's seminar, uh, the message that I'm hearing is that the role of services in our industrial policy is to be really sharpened. Uh, to leave us point, um, should we be looking for a separate master plan that would set uh, services uh, as an enabler to uh, other economic sectors and as a tradable service on its own or as a tradable sector on its own? And I think the issues of data and data collection and how do we collect information that enables us to make better informed policy choices uh, is one of the issues that have come up uh, in, the, in the seminar. I guess one of the questions still remains, is there still a room for us to pursue a, a service-led growth strategy um, that can complement some of uh, the, the work that we are already doing on industrial policy uh, as such? And how do we position services mainly as an anchor towards our industrialization, employment, innovation goals, and policy ambitions as we go forward? Um, with that said, uh, I would like to really thank TIPS for organizing this webinar. I think the role of services in our economic policy generally is very really underpaid. Uh, very few conversations are happening on how do we really promote services in a manner that can really complement and improve our, the competitiveness of our entire economy and really look for new niche opportunities in the service sector that are tradable that we can position as one of our export basket going forward. Uh, so uh, tips, I think we need to have more uh, conversations on, on, on services. And I don't think even in the DTIC itself, we are having enough conversations on how do we really uh, promote services in a manner that we can uh, uh, really you know, change uh, or, or bring about structural changes and transformation to some of the things that we are doing uh, to promote uh, the, 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 the growth in the economy. So with that said, um, I'd like to thank the participants uh, for joining. Um, if there's any pending issues, I could see on the chat uh, box, there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm and interest in this conversation. Um, to the extent that the tips, uh, colleagues are receptive to it, we can send through questions and we'll see how we can really keep the conversation in the debates around services going forward. Uh, with that said, um, I declare the seminar closed.